Okay, let's let's get started. We have vast amounts to get through this evening. Um, uh, so thank you for coming out here on, 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 a, on a Thursday evening to this London Counterfire meeting. Uh, this is a meeting of two main parts. The first of which uh, is a uh, a masterclass of sorts, uh, a, a lesson from Latin America uh, with uh, Jeffrey Weber, and I'll introduce him in a second. The second uh, part um, uh, is a, a, a sort of immediate response to the meltdown uh, in the in the Conservative Party, uh, May's meltdown, if you will. Um, we'll be t discussing that because you know it's good to have a laugh. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but uh, for the for the first sort of forty or so minutes. Um, we are delighted to uh, be in the company of Jeffrey Weber, uh, who uh, teaches uh, in the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. He's recently published uh, this book, The Last Day of Oppression and The First Day of the Same, copies of which are available uh, over there at the Pluto Press stall. We have two stalls here today, uh, over, over by the Pluto Press stall. Um, uh, they're available for a special price of £10 uh, this evening. Um, I've got to say, just from a cursory look, both the breadth uh, and the depth of this book uh, takes the breath away. Um, we have about yeah, 20 minutes uh, of, of, of talking time and then about as much time uh, in Q&A. So I think before um, I waffle on too much, uh, I should hand over to Jeffrey. Thanks for, having, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks very much for the uh, invitation to speak tonight. Um, I'll just apologize in advance for missing the second hour because I have a friend in town who's not normally in town, so I'm going to go see him. But uh, very happy to be here for the first the first bit. Um, what I thought I would do is uh, give a very brief, um, in 20 minutes, a kind of survey of the Latin American left from 1990 until the present moment obviously in very broad strokes. Um, and drawing on, on the book, uh, and I'll, I'll start with the, with the title, uh, The Last Day of Oppression and the First Day of the Same. This was taken from uh, an interview I did with Luis Marcus, an, an Ecuadorian uh, indigenous activist and anti-capitalist in, uh, in Ecuador, who uh, recalled this slogan from the early uh, 19th century uh, early Republican period in Ecuador. So they had achieved independence from Spain, but independence from Spain wasn't acquired through social revolution, but rather an elite, uh, an elite uh, war between Spanish descendants who wanted their own, uh, their own control over uh, an independent state, but with basically the social hierarchies in place that had been in place under, under um, colonialism, but under republicanism, they, they aspire to retain this control, but uh, to extract this wealth on their own behalf rather than on behalf of the Spanish crown. And so some, uh, some of the, those who struggle for independence with a much deeper vision of social transformation, quickly after independence, started uh, lining the walls of Quito with uh, graffiti that said, uh, the last day of despotism, meaning the end of Spanish conquest, uh, and the first day of the same, meaning we are under the same uh, rulers as we were before. In other words, the social revolution was still required. And I think uh, what Marcus was doing in re-articulating this vision in Ecuador in the 21st century, uh, with this last day of oppression and the first day of the same, was to point to some of the limitations of the experience of the last 15 years, some of the structural limitations, and to draw those out. Uh, and those are particularly important when you think about the potentiality of the early phase, uh, and, then, and then more or less what, to put it crudely, what, what, what went wrong, and what might have gone differently. So, with that said, uh, starting in 1990, I think you can say decisively that the Latin American left was at its lowest point uh, in, in modern history. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, mass guerrilla insurgencies of uh, Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, the Nicaraguan Revolution had been defeated very recently uh, through uh, massively uh, violent counterinsurgent campaigns, living a few hundred thousand dead in Central America. This was the, uh, the Reagan-backed uh, counterinsurgency throughout Central America. Um, uh, so that had decisively routed the, both the revolution in Nicaragua but also the, uh, the mass guerrilla forces that were never successful in Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, the neighboring countries. In the southern cone, 
uh, the bureaucratic authoritarian regimes, uh, or if you want, the neo-fascist regimes of um, the, the Argentine uh, junta from 1976 to 83, and in Chile from 1973 to 1990 under Pinochet, had uh, also through extraordinary violence uh, destroyed the social bases and political bases, the labor unions, peasant associations, human rights groups, feminist organizations, had physically annihilated their, their leadership and much more broadly. So you're talking 30,000 dead in Argentina uh, and a few hundred thousand dead in Central America. So much of that was the preceding violence necessary to unfold what happened in the 80s and 90s under formerly electoral regimes, but reliant on the previous crushing of the left of neoliberal economic restructuring. And what you saw as well, of course, was the um, isolation of the Cuban Revolution uh, because of the uh, collapse of the Soviet, the Soviet bloc, which meant the end to the principal uh, source of foreign exchange, the export market of sugar. Uh, the Soviet Union had bought up almost the entirety of foreign exchange because of the embargo, for, for, and this was the principal source of foreign exchange. So there was an immediate crisis in Cuba, which entered its own so-called special period of austerity, which was distinct from special period of neoliberalism elsewhere, but nonetheless was um, uh, an introduction of new market mechanisms, new, new forms of austerity inside of the Cuban state. Uh, so it would have been... Uh, I think very naive to have predicted by the end of the at the end of the decade Latin America would be the, at the leading edge of anti-neoliberal resistance in, in the world. Uh, there were some people who predicted that, but they were the people who always predict that no matter what the circumstances are. And so uh, I think there was good reason to be quite pessimistic given the, 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 the near uh, total ideological and political wipeout of the basis of the left and the, and the psychological uh, shadow of, of the terror of those regimes is not something to be underestimated in terms of the generational impact of rebuilding a new left. And economically, uh, you saw a massive depeasantization through the liberalization of agricultural markets and the total privatization of state-owned industries in all of the key sectors of most of Latin America. Um, and what that meant was an immediate uh, descaling of uh, of employment in these sectors, so public sector employment uh, led to an increasingly informal market in the uh, without trade unions, and that was coinciding with this uh, massive influx of migrants from the countryside, also looking for the, for the same diminishing jobs. So you saw unemployment rates move up, and this is really the the, the decade, the 80s and into the 90s, throughout the 90s of, of neoliberal hegemony in which. Uh, there was basically only defensive fightbacks from the left. Important ones, even famous ones, the Zapatistas, of course, is an anomalous situation in 90, 1994 in, in Chiapas in southern Mexico. The Landless Rural Workers Movement in Brazil, one of the largest movements in the world. Uh, 19, 1994, you saw um, indigenous movements in, in, in Ecuador and the Caracaso uh, urban riots uh, in, in Venezuela, sort of presaging the later Chavez phenomenon, were happening, but, but my argument is that none of these were offensive struggles for the left. These were defensive struggles against a tide of, of right wing uh, counter offensive. And so uh, there's a transition, and obviously I'm making this simplistic in the interest of time. The, the real transition point is, is begins in 1998, and that is the beginning of the steepest recession in South America since uh, the early onset of the debt crisis in the 80s. So you have four years of uh, <coughs> aggregate negative growth rate for all of South America, so not including Central America and Mexico, which, because of the integration into the American market, has different rhythms of accumulation, but you, but you have a deep recession in South America, which is not coincidentally where the new left arises, and much less so in Central America, much less so in Mexico. Um, and so what you have is two decades on the heels of two decades of neoliberal restructuring with increases in poverty, increases in unemployment, depeasantization, and so on, you have uh, right-wing, uh, uh, avowedly neoliberal regimes, that is to say regimes that, that profess a commitment to neoliberal restructuring in power when this crisis hits. And this crisis is, of course, a reverberation of the Southeast, crisis, Southeast Asian crisis of 97-98, the Russian crisis of 1999. It starts to filter into Brazil and Argentina, and Argentina has the biggest financial collapse in, the, in its history in 
And the only answer to this crisis, which was uh, a massive increase in all of the precarity uh, and social uh, devastation of the neoliberal period by these governments, was simply the execution of a more profound uh, uh, allotment of the same medicine. That is to say, more neoliberal restructuring. Red tape was holding us back for the 80s and 90s. What we need to do still is free the market and allow for private investment to take place of inefficient state investment and so on. But whereas this had had some ideological appeal in the early 80s in a, in a crisis of hyperinflation and, and the defeat of the left, after two decades of failed experimentation, this had no ideological resonance. And you can see this in basic, uh, the Latino barometer, for example, the, the Latin barometer of polling, shows that faith in the market in basic polling had plummeted from uh, drastic measures. So we're talking about single digits, believe that the market mechanisms could get you out of this crisis. But this didn't mean organizationally, obviously, that you could just seize on that sentiment. Uh, but what happened was a slow articulation uh, in the late 90s and into the early 2000s of an extra parliamentary left. So we're not talking about political parties. Most of the left political parties had already um, become embraced uh, inside of the neoliberal trajectory. So even former guerrilla parties and so on with revolutionary names had basically, over the 80s and 90s, shifted so far to the right that they were um, uh, often administering either at the municipal level or at state levels, uh, and sometimes even at the governmental level, neoliberal restructuring, the same parties that had once professed radical transformation. So it wasn't these old parties typically that, um, that were the, 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 uh, the avenues through which a new left was formed. Principally, you saw um, extra-parliamentary struggle with different social agents leading this in different countries. In Argentina, um, you had unemployed workers, recently unemployed workers, formerly industrial workers who are now unemployed, uh, organizing as the so-called picaderos, those who started cutting off uh, uh, highway traffic routes, the ability to uh, circulate commodities throughout the country. So they were no longer in a position to, to, to strike at the point of production, and they attempted to, uh, um, to uh, exercise with, with serious successes some of these other uh, strategies and tactics. Uh, in, a, in a period of crisis. They, they began this tactic in the, mid, in the mid 1990s, but it really takes off in the middle of the financial meltdown. Um, and what happened there was a radicalizing, downwardly descendant middle class who had their entire savings uh, frozen in bank accounts by the administrations as the, uh, as the value of the Argentine currency plummeted, right? So they, they were watching their life savings that they were not allowed to take out of the banks plummet. Uh, and this was massively radicalizing for layers of the population that would never have joined unemployed workers in the streets previously. So you have a, a complex coalition that throws out a series of governments and really lays the basis for uh, an articulation of, of a new kind of uh, Peronism, which is the traditional uh, populist uh, current inside of Argentine history, uh, and uh, uh, Argentine Peronism uh, in the form of Nestor Kirchner and then his later his wife, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, sees that, sees that uh, moment. Um, and we'll get into that in a moment. But in, in Bolivia, the agents are quite different. You have a much poorer uh, society, uh, a much less industrialized uh, working class uh, uh, than, than Argentina. Uh, and you have the situation of an indigenous majority, one of only two countries in uh, Latin America, whose indigenous population survived in the majoritarian way of the, the Spanish conquest. So you have 62% of the population self-identify as indigenous. Um, so this, um, this legacy of, of internal colonial relations with indigenous people, the racism of, uh, that, that capitalism assumed of a particular form of Bolivia, meant that there was, a, there was a unique dynamic in Bolivia of left indigenous politics, which is quite distinct from what was, what was happening in Argentina, where genocide against the indigenous population was very, very successful, uh, down to roughly 2% of the population in Argentina. Uh, um, so very different dynamics, but happening at the same time with the same uh, precipitator of the, of the crisis. So uh, the, the Cochabamba water war, the gas wars, all of this, uh, the overthrow of two presidents, I think Bolivia was the most militantly uh, potential for um, uh, radical transformation of, of any of these countries um, and um, really lays the basis for Evo Morales' election in 2005. 
Uh, and in Ecuador, similarly, indigenous movements at the heart of this, but in Ecuador, less urban, more rural, uh, and then later supported by public, militant public sector unions. And again, uh, serious mobilizations that overthrow uh, several heads of state and lay the basis eventually for the election of Rafael Correa in 2006. So those are the militant cases, but all over you see this new uh, effervescence of, of revolt. Moving into the next phase, uh, quickly so I can get through to the present, is the, uh, the 2003 to 2011 period is marked by two predominant features. The first is the, um, the muted uh, transformation of this extra-parliamentary militant left into uh, an electoral left. Center-left and left regimes come to office uh, transforming the formal electoral environment all throughout South America. So it's quite astonishing. Um, as I said, in the mid-1990s, virtually everywhere in South America was, was ruled by a government that was avowedly neoliberal. Uh, by um, the mid-2000s, it was impossible to run on a neoliberal ticket. Even if you were neoliberal, you had to run on a different ticket in order to have any success. Um, and it was primarily led by center-left and left governments. But what was uh, the other uh, dynamic of this was that the economic situation had changed dramatically. So rather than a recession, you had the beginning of a Chinese-driven uh, commodities boom, the first uptick in commodities. And there was tremendous pressure to, um, uh, to consolidate new relationships with multinational capital, to extract more natural gas, more oil, more mining minerals, more uh, monocrop agro-industry, agro and so on, um, in order to seize upon uh, what are always temporary high prices on the international market. Uh, and this is a very long-standing, recurring problem in Latin America. It's not, but this is the latest cycle. Uh, and, it, and it had the unique particularity of being driven by China. And why that's important is because the influence of the U.S. in the region, particularly in South America, really diminishes in this period, in part because uh, uh, if you look at the top trading partners of South American nations, in the 1990s, they were almost overwhelmingly the United States. By the mid-2000s, they were almost overwhelmingly uh, driven by Chinese uh, diamonds. Okay, um, and so what these center-left governments were able to do, uh, who came to power on the wave of uh, militant extra-parliamentary revolt, was to uh, respond immediately to some of their uh, pressing demands coming from below without actually uh, challenging capital in a serious way. Uh, and they were able to do that because even with modest uh, tax increases, royalty, royalty increases, and so on, i.e. not expropriation, nationalization, socialization, and so on, which happened in, in a very minimal way, uh, obviously with some discrepancies across cases, but very minimally across the board, uh, you still had a tremendous injection of revenue into these states. And what that allowed for was, was compensatory social programs. That is to say, a relatively minor share of the massive influx of state revenue, but nonetheless very important in terms of securing political support because this meant a transformation. Some people receiving education for the first time in their life, receiving health care for the first time in their life. This had a fundamental subjective uh, commitment to these new governments, despite the fact that this was contingent on um, an alliance with multinational capital that was contingent itself on continuing high commodity prices, which we all knew would not last forever. Uh, and so what happens uh, during the, uh, uh, the last phase that, that we're still in, I think, is the, the delayed reverberation of the global crisis into Latin America. So the global crisis, of course, as we all know, begins in 2007 in the United States uh, subprime mortgage crisis and begins an international phenomenon by 2008. But what's unique about South America is that growth rates have a slight dip in 2009, but they're steady all the way till 2011. So it seems as though, and many Keynesian economists argued that Latin American center-left states had, had, had managed, their, managed their capitalist states out of this crisis. They weren't subject to the dynamics. The naivete of that position was, was solidified in 2012, when because of China's slowdown, which was delayed, it began in 2011 rather than what happened elsewhere. And since 2011, every year in China has been the slowest pace of growth uh, since the early 90s in China. Um, uh, the commodity prices start to fall, and they're not picked up by, um, uh, by renewed dynamism either in the Eurozone or in the United States, which have both had very, very weak recoveries, which you could argue are not real recoveries, but, you, but they're called this, right? So um, the point is that the, that growth is not an alternative way to pick up the price of commodities. Uh, 
And so first mining mineral prices, agro, agro industrial products and so on start to fall, but then crucially oil falls massively in 2014, a massive fall. And 97% of revenue in, in, in Venezuela is generated through the oil economy by that point. And Venezuela was, of course, under Chavez and then under Maduro, financing through credit mechanisms and so on, some of the, uh, some of the social policies even of allied states. Um, all of this was immediately put into jeopardy, not just domestically in Venezuela, but, but uh, uh, elsewhere. And what you saw from around 2011, and when this really starts to pinch, 12, 2012, 2013, 2014, is the problem of uh, uh, center-left governments uh, responding to this uh, dramatic decrease in state revenue uh, uh, with a class choice. And they made the, ra the wrong class choice in almost every uh, decision, right? When you are faced with uh, declining revenues in this context, you have a class decision about who, play, who, pays, for the, uh, who pays for the austerity. Uh, you, one, one option would have been, for example, to even, even in, in the, a modest option would have been to uh, start to increase uh, massively the capital gains tax, the extractive taxes on these natural resource industries, which had only gone up to the median in the world market and never, had never exceeded it in most cases. This would have been a, an immediate uh, attempt to fill some of, the, some of the depleting resources in order to continue the programs that were, uh, and employment generating schemes that were making these governments popular. Uh, uh, that would have been the, the modest, a more, a more, um, a more radical uh, option, which was possible, I think, in some of the more advanced dynamics in Venezuela, in Bolivia, uh, and so on. Uh, would have been full-scale appropriation, the, the beginnings of, of a socialization, redirection of, of priorities in terms of, in terms of national development towards some uh, internal uh, market development and so on. You can have a debate about what was possible in that moment, but I think what's clear is that what was actually decided was the administration of center-left governments and left governments introducing new forms of austerity on their populations. And the bet that they made were that they were that the finance and multinational capital that they had courted uh, would remain allied with them and that they could count all the same on their social basis despite the deteriorating social conditions that they were now enduring. And this was naive on both fronts because capital, although it learned to live with these governments after early attempts at destabilizing them, but when net profits had continued to rise, as they did over this entire period, across the board, uh, they were, able, they, they were able to live with that political reality so long as it was necessary. Uh, but it was never their first choice or natural choice to align with these governments. And so as soon as they enter into crisis, um, uh, so for example, Dilma Rousseff, in her first administration in Brazil, introduced a finance minister who was the most far-right finance minister in recent times in Brazil as an indication to finance mm -hmm. capital that she was uh, willing to play their game. But they quickly abandoned her, uh, or I mean, they never went to her. Uh, meanwhile, her base has also disappeared because she was also undermining the, the, what little appeal remained in the Workers' Party in Brazil. And what you then see is, and I'll, ra I'll wrap up in this because I know that I'm, I'm, I'm slightly abusing my time. A couple of minutes. The, um, you see basically two dynamics happening, I think. Where, where, where it's possible the right has rearticulated itself in, in, in sometimes in totally new parties, in other times through novel reconfigurations of old alliances in electoral sphere. So they win the presidential elections uh, using the mayor, the former mayor of Buenos Aires in, in Argentina. Uh, and even if they hadn't won, the Peronists ran their furthest right candidate uh, in recent memory, the furthest right Peronists since Carlos Menem of the 1990s. So even if they hadn't won, it still would have been a rightward trajectory in Argentina. But it was the worst possible outcome with Mauricio Macri. Um, in, in Brazil, where they weren't able to win in elections, they had a, uh, what's sometimes called a parliamentary coup, a soft coup, um, in other words, an unconstitutional overthrow of a democratically elected center-left government for, a, a, for Tamara, the, the new uh, unaccountable, unelected president. And in Honduras, uh, the, 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 with an actual military coup in June 2009 against Manuel Zelaya. In Paraguay, a constitutional coup against Fernando Lugo. So where they're not able to win elections, they do this. And there's combinations in Venezuela. They won legitimately, the, I think, um, the congressional elections in November of 2015. Um, and uh, obviously the same people who had previously conducted 
coup attempts and, uh, and other destabilizing uh, attempts, but they won those elections, and they are very, very likely to win any other uh, subsequent election that, that is freely held in, in Venezuela under current conditions, uh, despite the fact that they're not very popular. But what's interesting about this moment, and this is my last point, is that um, this, new la this new right is not easing its way into an easy new hegemony that's replaced a declining left hegemony. Because the problem of the new right is that they are, they are faced with having no solution to the same crisis that they're inheriting from the left. Um, and so you see Tamara at single-digit popularity almost immediately after he's in power. Um, Mauricio Macri is facing the largest series of strikes in Argentina in, in recent memory, and now massive mobilizations around the missing uh, indigenous activist in the south who is fighting uh, soy production and so on. Um, it's become a massive campaign in that country, um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you're likely to see a, a new uh, decisive instability impasse in the region, uh, which sounds you know, like a wishy-washy answer, but I think that's what you're saying. It, it's not clear who's going to win this. But what I think needs to be understood decisively is that you can't return in an easy way to uh, this, the center-left, some kind of renewal of the PT, which is attempting to happen in, in Brazil, or something similar in other cases, because they were, in many ways, a fundamental uh, problem in their, in their later period in, in allowing this crisis to unfold as it did. Um, so what is required, I think, is a longer-term horizon for the left, and I'm not saying this just like lessons for Latin America from, from Jeff Weber, but, the, but following on what debates, the most decisive debates happening from below, uh, from the most interesting parts of the left in Latin America, are themselves saying, we need to have a temporal vision which isn't about just winning the next elections, but, but rebuilding a transformative left, which is unlikely to happen, for example, in Brazil by 2018, the next presidential elections, uh, very unlikely to happen, and the PT is going to be the only infrastructure to go to go in those elections. So you need to have a vision which is not so immediately presentist uh, that you're only responding to that ribbon. It doesn't mean ignoring elections, but it does mean having some vision of rebuilding which, which looks further away and takes into account the depth of, of the defeat. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a, uh, a, a dizzying history, the lessons of which are, um, are startling. Uh, we have uh, 15 to 20 minutes to discuss some of those lessons. Um, uh, I think we'll take questions maybe in batches of three or four. Um, who, would like to, who would like to open us? Um, on, on, on Brazil, uh, what now in the long term question, uh, because um, the right doesn't want Lula uh, in power, that's clear. Um, and um, it, can the left afford to wait a long time uh, to have, to, to have uh, build an alternative? I think what's important um, from my perspective is that um, to see a rehabilitation of the PT as no solution to the crisis, a false solution to the crisis. Um, uh, so, I mean, I can see <clears throat> um, uh, why that would appeal to some people under the conditions, but I think uh, a long, the longer term that I'm talking about are the attempts by organizations like PESOL and others, which are small, but uh, to build uh, an independent left, which I think if we treat it realistically, is not something that's, I mean, it took, it took since the mid-80s to build the PT. This is not going to be something that happens immediately. But this will just be a prolonged uh, re-articulation of the old crisis if the PT comes to power. Because the PT, particularly under Lula, but under any new leader, is not going to be a transformed party. Um, uh, and, uh, they performed like a, a right-wing social democratic party of any, uh, uh, um, like a new labor in Britain, except with a, a better uh, capitalist environment in which to distribute wealth, so the outcomes were better. 
but this, I think, had much less, less to do with the PT than it did. Uh, so any, in any case, for me, Brazil is likely to look very bad in the short term, no matter how this, this plays out. Um, uh, but I think putting faith in the left, in the PT, would be, would be a mistake. Um, um, and rather to look at some of the early days of the June 2013 movement, for example, the early period of it, before it was, before it was taken over by, by the right, some of those impulses, the struggles around the World Cup and so on, I think some of those energies from below are the potentials of a new, of a new left in Brazil. In Ecuador, uh, I mean, there's a lot to say about Ecuador. Uh, um, you asked why I didn't criticize the corruption. I mean, I didn't say a lot of things uh, in, the, in, the, in the talk. I was speaking at a general regional level, but um, I think what we need I mean, I think it's a fair thing to ask about corruption, particularly with the jailing the vice president for his uh, pilfering of a several million dollars allegedly into uh, his, his personal enrichment uh, is, a, is a problem. But I think we need a, I think we need a, um, a Marxist perspective on, on, on corruption, um, which means, I think, thinking about this less as... as uh, I mean, the, the real problem with debating corruption is that it's almost always a force that the right wins at mobilizing around. And the left, I think, needs to learn how to think about this much more seriously. The Venezuelan case is a good example because uh, by conservative estimates, about $30 billion worth of state oil revenue has gone missing. Uh, that's a conservative estimate over the last 16 years. But the thing is, is not to see this as... Um, a few bad guys enriching themselves. What this is is a is a bureaucratic, social, principally military layer that was invited into into the um, uh, into the highest apparatuses of the Bolivarian project. By the end, by now, now you have fifty percent of the of the Maduro cabinet are military officials. Fifty percent of governors are military officials. But they're not just military officials. In in my view, they are, there are also a new hybrid of, of, of state capitalists. That is to say, they, they have accumulation techniques, which some people call corruption, but I, I think these are, these are accumulation techniques to manipulate the, their unique access to the state, which allows for unique access to licenses, unique access to trading goods, which are supposed to be outside of the market, to, uh, to trading uh, uh, at, different, at different levels of the currency because of the discrepancy, to pilfering goods into Colombia, to sell at market prices of goods that are subsidized, most of this is done by uh, new accumulation strategies by bureaucrats inside of the state. And that extraordinary wealth accumulation is what's being defended right now inside of the Maduro regime. But it, not enough, I don't think, to make a moral appeal about just good behavior on the part of governments. It's to say you can't have a left government that allows for the creation of, um, uh, of private accumulation inside of its bureaucracy. And not just a small amount. I mean, this is extraordinary, and that's what's being fought over right now. And this is why Maduro is in a very difficult situation, because it's the, also the military. It's not just it's not just anyone who's doing this. In Ecuador, it's not the same dynamic because the military does not play the same role. Uh, and I, I would go on too long if I went into it. But I mean, I agree that the Correa administration had. I think it had very little to do with, with the left after 2010. Um, uh, when it when it fundamentally broke with uh, the with the legacy of the Constituent Assembly, which I think was a very positive thing. Like you, I would have, if I were in Ecuador, I would have supported this. The president of the Constituent Assembly, Alberto Acosta, was was quite interesting. The first president, the first minister of Mines and Energy, and so on. There's a lot going on, but then there was an alliance made with mining multinational capital, oil multinational capital, and suddenly indigenous people became terrorists, subject to terrorist legislation that had been introduced by earlier administrations of the right facing massive sentences for basic protests and so on against mining companies. Um, so in, in terms of movement party relations uh, on the left, um, I think, uh, I guess, two lessons, I guess, uh, I think, to, to be understood. Um, the first is uh, the unevenness of of how strong movements were in different places, I think. Um, 
Uh, so in Bolivia, I think you had very, very uh, high level of self-organization, high level of, of, of capacity to mobilize. Uh, and it's therefore the most potential for um, uh, transformation from below uh, and um, a kind of a potentiality for a fruitful relationship with the, with the party. And I'll say more about what actually happened. In, in, in Venezuela, I think you had a, you had, the, I mean, not everyone agrees with me, obviously, but my take on Venezuela is that the story that the story of official Chavismo is that 1989 there was a Caracaso, the the riots of, of uh, and the repression of those riots, and then a, and then a tide of, of an upturn of revolts ever since then that culminated in the election of Hugo Chavez and has risen ever since until the recent crisis. I think. The, my reading of the actual history of Venezuela is 1989, Caracaso was an important series of riots and popular rebellions, but it was primarily unorganized, spontaneous, and unable to articulate much, which is why the first expression of politics by Chavez was a military coup attempt, not, not in order to substitute for the absence of, of activity. And, and so, you have a, so you really have an empty shell of a party. You don't even have a party. It's a very loose collection in 1998, 1999 when he first comes to office. It's really in 2002 when there's a military coup attempt against him that you see the first activities uh, of a serious uh, organization from below, the beginnings of it. And that's when the process becomes most interesting because they are able to push Chavez far beyond whatever he imagined he would be. Uh, I mean, it's notorious that Chavez never used the word socialism until 2005. It's not coincidental, it has to do with the radicalization from below in that process. Um, but what does he do in that moment? That, so this is a very auspicious moment, right? Supporting the government against the right, but also pushing the government well beyond what it's intending to do. Even as they call themselves Chavistas, they won't just take orders. Um, but uh, Chavez creates a, a party which was quickly hollowed out uh, the, the United Socialist Party of Venezuela. At the beginning, it had potential. It had different currents who were allowed into it to debate and so on. Most of the left was inside of it. Uh, over the last several years, almost all of the left has left it because what they've done is even when there's a, even when there's democratic local campaign to decide who your candidates are, they were nonetheless appointed uh, from from uh, from above. And this is how the military started to being introduced into the party apparatuses. None of these people were elected as military officials. This was appointments from above. Um, and so people decided that this was an electoral machine, and not, and not even that a machine uh, driven by uh, diktats from. Um, and so, I mean, the legacy of Chavez is still very popular, but I think there are important lessons to learn about. You, an empty electoral machine is not going to do, not going to do anything. And in, in, in Bolivia, what happened, to, I'll just to be brief on this, was um, a movement that I think was far, far ahead of where the movement towards socialism party was uh, was willing to go, um, and in fact the, the the party played a role of of containing the movement in in decisive moments in 2003-2005 by negotiating, for example, constitutional exits to what I think was a pre-revolutionary pre situation in 2005. Again, there's much debate on this, but they held the capital. They held most of the western part of the city. It was permanent mobilization, and there were actual talks about how to how to um, seize and socialize power through a constituent assembly, which would have violated the constitution um, uh, because you should you're just supposed to have a succession to vice president. Um, and it was Morales who negotiated that succession to vice president, uh, who then only lasted a few months because there was a new eruption, and then he was overthrown, and then Morales came to. Elections, but again, he negotiated a constitutional exit there through elections. So he was very popular because he, it was the only party that had any cr cross-regional uh, articulation, and the and the elections uh, uh, were being uh, were completely polarized between a far right and uh, an indigenous left candidate. Um, but many people were still not excited to vote. For him, even in the first elections, he won decisively, massively, 54%, which is historic in Bolivian terms. But what he did very cleverly after this was all of the principal leaders of the principal trade unions, principal social movements, and so on, were were brought into the different levels of the state. Um, 
but without any of the uh, renowned consultation processes in, in Bolivian trade unions, where you, I mean, during the 2000 to 2005 period, trade union leaders could not simply make decisions without popular assemblies and so on. All of this was done without popular assemblies' consent, uh, and these these leaders became sort of minor minor ministers within the state, but with access to new funds and so on. Um, and so the defense, so the two lessons, I think, because I've gone on too long, the, the two lessons there are to retain, uh, certainly defend the Morales government as, as, as these movements always did against the right when they tried to destabilize them, but to, to, to defend the autonomy of class institutions, for example, the trade union movement, the right to strike against, against uh, so the right to strike was, was demonized in the Morales, as if the working class ought not to um, uh, mobilize around its own interests because there's a favorable government. And this was a disaster. In fact, many trade union officials were, were involved in this, the containing of their own rank and files. So um, an autonomy of, and, and on the other side, parties that actually function in a, in a revolutionary and pluralist manner in which you can actually have debates over, over over real um, crises rather than pretend that there is no crisis and that it's an economic war just manipulated by the right. I think this is a disaster because it produces no actual solutions for the continuity of So I, I hardly solved the problem of movement and party relations, but uh, sort of, that's how I would read the situation. If there are any last questions, I'm going to ask Jeffrey to sum up and respond to those three questions. Okay. Um, uh, so, in terms of uh, Lindsay's question on um, lessons for here um, and Trump, uh, I mean, I, I guess insofar as we can make comparisons, I think um, um, navigating the relationship with a potential Corbyn uh, government insofar as, um, uh, I mean, this is a very general statement, but um, the attacks that Corbyn would instantly face, um, uh, pressuring uh, independently from the Labour Party to, to attempt to influence the Labour Party um, for the most audacious measures when faced with those attacks, rather than, uh, uh, than moving to the, the, the impulse to compromise, um, uh, because um, even, I mean, unlike the situation in Latin America, the, the, the health of capitalist dynamism is very unlikely when Corbyn comes to office. So he won't even have that, uh, that basic ground which, which allowed for the survival of, uh, of the center left, despite the contradictions. That's what happened. So that would be some it would be sort of an immediate, an immediate uh, problem, um, and I don't have this. I don't think I can, you know, generate a series of, kind of policy advice uh, in, in this sensor, But, um, but in the general idea of uh, of moving moving decisively and early to set the sort of um, the character of what is to come and the and the kind of fights that will be necessary for that to to trans to, to tra transpire. Um, um, and I think moving early now is the, the, the timing of this, um, because it sets a tone of, of conflict rather than uh, compromise. In terms of the trade union movement and the wider left, such as it is in in Britain, um, uh, I think um, uh, retaining the ability to act independently, even as you have to, at times defend Corbyn against, against right-wing attacks is something also to learn. The idea that uh, there needs to be a, an attempt to defend um, the independent interests of the, of the class despite having a, a, a potentially friendly, but friendly under huge constraints, uh, government in power. So, I mean, that doesn't do justice to the question, but that's my intent. And Trump, I, I mean, I think Trump is, Maybe I'll do Trump and American imperialism at the same time, so I don't go on for forever. Um, I think American imperialism 
Um, well, first of all, let's just say imperialism, because I think it's become, uh, there are several actors in the region um, that I think uh, uh, are involved in a kind of non-military inter-imperial rivalry in different ways. Um, what you saw, I think, was a, uh, a decrease in the ability of American power to project itself in South America. In, in Mexico and Central America, I don't think the dominance has, has uh, deteriorated. Most of Mexico is more or less a subordinate integrated into the North American market. Um, and in many ways, so are the Central American states, because uh, El Salvador's principal, by far and away, the key source of foreign exchange is remittances from migrant labor. So the integration is different for them. But in, uh, but in South America, because of this unique commodities boom, for example, the World Bank and IMF, which was able to basically, and which I think is an expression of American imperialism, was able to uh, set the agenda over the 80s and 90s. What you see is a massive decline of World Bank influence, IMF influence, uh, over that, over the 2000s, in which they're basically irrelevant, although they're starting to return. Um, uh, and you started to see uh, new subordinate debt relations with China, uh, and so on. But I think the big, the, the, the big, uh, uh, one of the, the big limits of the, of, the, of the moment was what uh, Claudio Katz has pointed out in the attempts to form regional counter-imperial regional integration projects, even with their limits, I and mean, they were never going to be socialist from the beginning, but the, the, the Bank of the South, uh, ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance for Peoples of Our America, etc., which were all, uh, and even at the ideological level, Telesur and so on, but which were Venezuelan projects because Venezuela was financing it, but integrated various allied states. Those projects, uh, had they grown, uh, I mean, they, they were pretty dead in the water uh, fairly quickly, but had they grown, you could, see, you could have seen, for, for example, collective negotiations with investment agents with China and extractive sectors and new debt obligations rather than bilateral uh, uh, agreements because what this has meant is a tremendous subordination to China because Ecuador negotiating with China alone results in devastating the asymmetrical terms. Ecuador negotiating with China together with multiple countries would have been a different, a potentially different story. Um, so there were limits on the autonomy. I mean, in some ways, it was a shift to different to different powers. Um, but the Trump phenomenon is 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 is, is difficult to to fathom, not just in foreign policy, but um, because the key way that the U.S. was attempting to influence itself in terms of economic imperialism was through, after the failure of the Free Trade Area of the Americas, which failed early in the 2000s, they tried a series of bilateral free trade agreements, which was successful in, in multiple places. Basically, the remaining conservative governments, Peru, Mexico, Colombia, and so on. Um, and then they were attempting to um, build those uh, into part of the Trans-Pacific um, uh, alliance, right? Through, through basically all of the countries they allied with were along the Pacific in order to access the the uh, Asia Pacific markets and and in a, in a greater part of the of the the Asian pivot. Um, so, uh, but there was also military expansion, the, the renewal of new military bases. The drug war is astonishingly alive in in, in Mexico, and Central America. The, the use of, uh, of language of, of narco-terrorism to justify the total militarization of the corridor from Colombia all the way to, uh, I mean, we're talking extraordinary, I mean, higher levels of daily death than, uh, than during the 1980s uh, Civil War. Uh, so, um, uh, and U.S. imperialism is in, implicated in that. And, and also Canadian imperialism, which is less uh, strongly talked about, but Canada's, I just wrote a book on this to plug that. <laughs> Canadian mining is the biggest actor in, in extraction in, in, it's not American, it's Canadian mining and finance. Um, so people don't often think of Canada in that way, but it's a, it's a, it's a truly important actor. So I think I've said enough.
So be thank you so much for putting in those extra few minutes, and uh, thank you for giving us so much uh, to think about. Thank you.